<laughs> okay. <laughs> Sometimes it's nice on a, if you're on a retreat, like a meditation retreat, where there's more meditation, it's often it's nice to do, you know, you give a talk and then you meditate afterwards, often nice. Here there's kind of a lot, yeah, just woo. <laughs> But uh, we have to do things differently, so it's, okay. it's, it's not a problem, but uh, it's just that uh, there is a, is a lot, so we'll just see how we, how we go, I suppose. So, so um, okay, so uh, we are slowly, slowly going through the first noble truth, uh, yeah, one word at the time almost, uh, death, we just did death is suffering, uh, and uh, we're going to continue, uh, so the, uh, uh, the next ones here also very obvious. I'm going to do them all together because they kind of belong together in a sense. Uh, association with the disliked is suffering. Uh, separation from the liked is suffering. Uh, not getting what you want uh, is suffering. Uh. So, w what is meant by association with the disliked? Well, it means every time you feel something which is unpleasant, uh, that's association with the disliked. Uh. Every time somebody says something to you that you don't want to hear, every time you, you know, kind of you get a dent in your car because you <laughs> crash into something, uh, any time something happens which is unpleasant, uh, that is association with the disliked. Uh, every time you have to hang out with people that you, whatever it is, uh, uh, that is a problem. Separation from the liked, yeah, this is whenever you kind of something, you lose something or something disappears, all the things that we were talking about before, uh, anything that kind of happens, someone gets ill, someone dies, uh, and all of these, these little things in life, not actually quite big things in life, uh, that happen all the time. Uh. Not getting what you want is suffering, uh. you know about that? Uh. Yeah. <laughs> So that's, that's also part of life. You cannot always get what you want. Uh, and you can see little children, yeah, when they are small, sometimes they don't get, get what they want. They get into tantrums and all kinds of things uh, because uh, they, can't, they don't know how to deal with that, not getting what they want. Uh, and of course, as you get older, you have to learn how to deal with that because uh, you understand life. You cannot, you cannot always have what you want. In fact, often you're not going to get it. Uh. So these things are pretty obvious. But uh, what uh, is not perhaps as obvious as you think it is. Uh, and uh, the reason for that is because we tend to think that we are in charge of the world, uh, yeah, in charge of our own lives, uh, that we can control things, we can make things be one way or the other. Uh, yeah? And because that's what we think, and this is, comes from the sense of self, uh, it comes from the ego, this feeling that we are in control and we can kind of do things. Uh, yeah, if you have a life where you have no control of anything, it's easy to get depressed because you feel your life is out of control. External things are controlling everything. Yeah. It's easy to get depressed because you feel that you are always the uh, recipient of everything, but you cannot control anything yourself. Uh. So this feeling of control actually sometimes stops us from getting depressed. Uh. But it's important to understand how little control we actually have over things, yeah? How the world tends to go in certain ways, uh, and regardless of what we do, the world still continues in those ways. Uh. And a typical example is uh, how other people speak to us. Uh. Yeah, I, are you like me, that sometimes people don't say things to you that are not nice? Uh? Has that ever happened to you? Uh, happens to everyone, yeah? People say things uh, and it's not really nice, they may be coming from the wrong place uh, and it feels bad. Uh, this is one of the kind of one of those things in life which is almost all that happens all the time, almost every day. It's hard to go through a day without somebody not saying something which isn't quite pleasant. Uh, why? Well, because other people are under stress and other people have their problems uh, and they sometimes they just vent and it comes out of them uh, and then it comes out the wrong way and it's very problematic. Uh, yeah, that this is part and parcel of life, and yet somehow we sometimes get upset when other people say something bad. Yeah, it's easy to get a bit angry or upset with the other person. Uh, and uh, the reason we get angry very often is because we feel it should be different. Uh, often we think that by being angry we're going to solve the issue. If I'm angry, then that will tell them they shouldn't talk like that. In the future it will be different. Uh, but actually very often it doesn't work like that. If you get angry, sometimes the other person gets even worse 
Yeah, because uh, maybe they kind of stop for a while and then after trying to control themselves for a while it gets even worse. Because remember, the reason people do things that they do is not because it's personal, huh? got nothing to do with you, it's because of their inner conditioning. Huh? They are doing things because of who they are, not because who you are. Huh? So it's very hard for them to control themselves if it is all the habits coming out of them. So if you try to get angry with them, what often happens is that they try to use willpower to control themselves, or either that or maybe they don't care at all, but let's say they try to use willpower to control themselves, and then after a while it comes out even worse, because that willpower is not sustainable, and then it comes out even worse in the long run. And anyway, most people in the world, we cannot have any control over any way. Yeah, politicians, uh, people in the world who, s who write bad things, t politicians who write bad things on Twitter. Uh, I don't know if you heard, ab heard about those politicians. Uh, uh, <laughs> but, uh, <laughs> and uh, so we cannot do much about that, yeah. And there's not much point really in getting upset. If you think about it carefully, you realize that reacting with upset or anger is usually counterproductive, uh, often makes the person more defensive. So the right way to think about this uh, is to remember that people saying bad things to you, to every one of you, to me, to the Buddha, to it doesn't matter who you are, people said bad things to the Buddha, how do you think you're going to escape if the Buddha couldn't escape? Uh, yeah, if the Buddha can't escape, nobody can escape. This is just the nature of the world. If you understand this is how it is, uh, then you don't get so upset anymore. Uh, if someone said something bad to you, think, oh yeah, you're saying something bad to me, that's all right, yeah. <laughs> I don't say that, but think, think like that, yeah? You don't say those things, you just think like that. You realize, actually, this is just par for the course. It's to be expected that people say silly things. People are silly. Silly entities say silly things. Uh, you know what I mean? Uh, <laughs> that's just how it has to be. It can't be any otherwise. Uh, and this is the right way of thinking, yeah? yeah? In other words, you understand the nature of existence, and then you bear that unwelcome and harsh or negative speech, you bear it because you understand it is part of reality. This is the right way of thinking. Yeah. Then it doesn't upset you so much anymore. And when it doesn't upset you so much anymore, you become this even person, go through life evenly. Instead of being a kind of yo-yo person, you become an even person. What do you think is best, yo-yo person or even person? Huh? Even is better, yeah, because you, are, you kind of have a feeling of uh, you know, feeling of calm yeah, and peace. You don't allow emotions to kind of, you know, blow you around all the time. And then when you sit down to meditate, you already have a head start because you're quite key, uh, calm and peaceful already. Uh, there are many things in life that are like that. There are things that are par for the course. Uh, other people's speech is one thing. Uh, another one is like pain in the body. Uh, yeah, body, always problems in the body, always little pains here and there. The older you get, the more there is of pains in the body. When you get to a certain age, you always have a pain somewhere, yeah? That's what they say anyway. I, I'm, I'm not sure if I quite reached that age yet, but getting there very quickly, yeah? yeah? It won't be long before I'm there, yeah? Maybe next time I come, I will be there. It depends on when, when that is. Uh, but um, it happens very fast, yeah? Especially when you get to maybe 70 or 75 or 80, or thereabouts, uh, then or oh, always problems. Uh. So pain in the body, to be expected. Uh. Yeah? If nothing has gone wrong, and then you learn to bear those things, you learn to flow with these things. Uh. And many things in life are of this kind of nature uh, that you have to learn to bear with them. Uh. Yeah? Being united with that which is unwholesome, uh, you learn to bear with that, and you can carry on as a, as a consequence. Uh. And uh, life, is like, life is very much like that. Uh. <laughs> But um, this idea that you can never get what you want is basically a reality of sensual existence, yeah, of this existence with the five senses. Uh, and uh, it, is all, it is always going to be like that. And one way of thinking about this uh, is to just notice when things in the world upset you. Uh, yeah, when is it that you read something or you hear about something or you see something on TV or whatever? Uh, and it upsets you. Huh? Do you ever get upset by politics, for example? Huh? Yeah, okay, it, uh, almost everybody gets upset by politics, yeah? Huh? And it doesn't matter which country it is, it's not just in Malaysia, it's everywhere in the world. Huh? You see politicians who do crazy things and you get upset. Huh? Why is it that you get upset? And the reason why you get upset uh, is that you haven't really taken this thing on board yet. Uh, 
the world is out of control. You're not always going to get what you want. Because that also is in the sensual realm. Yeah? It's part of the sensual realm. You see the politician on TV, that's the sensual realm. Part of this realm of the five senses. That entire realm is out of control. When you see politicians doing stupid things, it's to be expected. The reason why you don't like it is because you are attached to an idea of what it should be like. It shouldn't be like this, it should be like that. That is the problem. Yeah? So it is really part and parcel of the attachment to the sensual realm. This is a very large attachment. So every time something happens and you feel upset about it, it is because you have a, you're holding on to something, you're attached to an idea, you think the world should be in a certain way, when actually the world isn't like that. The world is out of control. The whole five sensual realm is out of control. You can expect things to go wrong, you can expect things to go away that you don't like. That is the right attitude. So when politicians do something crazy, shrug your shoulders. That's what politicians do. When you feel that the political system is going downhill, yeah, and all kind of more kind of autocratic, there's a lot of autocratic figures now around the world, Pe people like strong people who take control of things and do bad things, often they do very bad things as well. Yeah, it's not a bad idea sometimes to have a little bit of democratic oversight so you can chuck the bad people out. Yeah, I don't know, you recently you had, um, you chucked out one of these fellows here in Malaysia, yeah, who, who was kind of, he was voted out of office because many people thought he was corrupt, yeah, that was what was happening, yeah. And this is good ara everywhere around the world, this can be a very handy way of doing things. Uh. So, uh, but again, it goes in a different way, yeah, yeah? things don't go according to the way we would like it, uh, and that is always the nature of the world. Uh. Or take climate change. Uh, climate change is now kind of becoming a really big disaster in places like Australia. Uh, I don't know if you, did you see about all the bushfires in Australia? Yeah, very, very big. Millions of acres that be burnt up uh, in Australia. Thousands of homes were destroyed. Uh, lots of people really being desperate because of what is going on. Uh, so what should we do? And it's easy to get upset, especially with the Australian government, because it's a useless government in Australia. Uh, I usually became Australian citizen. I'm wondering whether I should give up my citizenship already. Because <laughs> that government, hopeless government, yeah? It's, I mean, it's easy to complain about politicians. I don't know if I could do any better, but still, you know, it's still, it's, uh, it really is a kind of backward government. Everything is going wrong. Yeah? It's obvious that climate change is a big problem, and they don't really do anything about it. It's kind of crazy here. Yeah? It's almost immoral. Yeah, it's going to affect so many people, future generations, and it, you don't actually do anything. Uh, I find it very, very strange. Uh, but, what do we expect? Uh, maybe that's what we should expect. Yeah, maybe this is exactly how things are. Maybe the world is irrational. The world doesn't work according to the laws of ration rationality. People do strange things. Politicians don't act at the right time. We have this massive problem coming over. All of humanity is going to be affected by this. Uh, every one of us is going to be affected by climate change in the long run, and still we can't get our act together. It's kind of crazy here. So uh, then you realize, actually, it's just the nature of human beings, uh, the nature of society, that we can't do these things. It is literally out of control. Uh, so when you see these things happening, uh, instead of being desperate, uh, instead of feeling that, oh, the, everything is going down the drain and becoming uh, depressed about it, like the people in Hong Kong were becoming depressed about the Hong, about the Hong Kong situation. Uh, it was very fascinating when I was there in Hong Kong, because I was teaching a retreat. Uh, and then I was teaching this retreat, uh, and then you had Q&A in the evening, like we're going to have here as well. Uh, and then the question would come, yeah, and one question said, well, these demonstrators, you know, they, they are getting violent, you know, aren't they bad? What do you think about these demonstrators? Uh, I didn't know what to say, I was kind of, oh, okay. And then the next question was, well, the government, the police, they are using violence. You know, aren't these police and government, aren't they bad? That was the next question. <laughs> and I got this feeling that the audience in front of me was divided. Half the audience was kind of supporting the demonstrators, the other half was supporting the government. <laughs> I had to be really careful. Yeah, if I said the wrong thing, I would alienate half, half the crowd. So it was a very, very interesting situation to be in. Uh, actually, it's, quite, it's not so difficult as a Buddhist monk because I don't really take political positions. Uh, 
But uh, so what I say, uh, anyone who uses violence is bad. Everyone who uses violence is in the wrong. It doesn't matter if it's a student or the government. Uh, if you use violence, then you have lost the plot. You're already acting in an immoral way. Uh, and in that way, you kind of get out of it. You don't need to take sides, yeah, because it's a political situation. I don't know the answer to politics. Uh, uh, but uh, what I do know is that if you use violence, then obviously you are creating problems for yourself and for society here. Uh. But it was kind of desperate in Hong Kong. Yeah? People were really, it, this was very, very powerful. I didn't really understand how powerful it was until I was there. And everybody wanted me to take sides with them. Yeah? <laughs> but of course, no way I'm going to take sides in that kind of situation. Yeah? But, uh, and uh, of course, the answer is, uh, you know, in the end, if I was a pro-democracy dem demonstrator in Hong Kong, I would be very careful because the Chinese government is incredibly powerful. Yeah? Who is going to win in the long run? It's pretty obvious the Chinese government is going to win in the long run. Uh, it is to me anyway. I don't know. I can't see any other way. But so if I was a pro-democracy, I, I would be kind of <laughs> be careful in that kind of situation, just looking at the facts on the ground without taking any position. Uh, I would be very careful. But what you do in that kind of situation is again to remember the world of politics is uncertain. Uh, it's unreliable. Of course Hong Kong is not going to be stable. Of course Malaysia is not going to be stable. Even Singapore, the most stable of stable places, is not going to be stable. Yeah? Down the track, that too, is gonna, there's going to be problems there. Uh, it's th this is just the nature of existence. Uh, so the answer to all of those Hong Kong people is that you should expect this. Uh, this is the time to go on a retreat. Uh, this is not the time to go demonstrating in the streets and be angry. Come on the retreat. Listen to what the Buddha has to say about this. He says it's out of control. Of course Hong Kong is in trouble. Of course the Chinese government is gradually taking over. This is the nature of the world. And then it will change again. Yeah, I sometimes I, I think about the Second World War, the Second World War was very, very bad in Europe and millions and millions of people dying in Europe. Uh, and of course, the fighting, the war is about principles. Yeah, there's like, there's Hitler in Germany and then there's uh, much of the rest of Europe against Hitler in Germany. And then everyone says, we have to fight. It's about principles. It's about not being overtaken by a bad government. But sometimes I wonder whether that's the right answer. Is that the right answer? Even in that situation where you have a man who obviously is very evil in many ways, uh, is that the right answer? Or is it better to say, please come and take over our country, yeah? No worries, take it over. And then what happens next is that then there will be no war because you just say, come in. And then after a while, Hitler might get you know, fed up with owning this country anyway. So say, okay, go your own way. Yeah? Or he might die soon anyway. I mean, how long does any of these dictators last? And then when he dies, what happens then? Things probably start to go back again to what they were before. Yeah? They only last so long, these things. So maybe sometimes we just become stupid. We kind of forget that the world is inherently unreliable. Allow the world to change. Go with the flow. And when you go with the flow of things, uh, you can be peaceful in the midst of all of these upheavals, uh, yeah, all of these problems. Uh, and you don't have to worry so much about it. Uh. It's almost like you expect the whole world to go under. Uh, yeah, Because you don't know what's going to happen with the world. Uh, and when you expect anything to happen, uh, then you can kind of allow things to go. Uh. You can go with the flow. You don't be so concerned about it. Uh. It's easy to say and hard to do. Huh? Many of you probably have children. Actually, I know that many of you have children. Huh? And of course, then it's even more difficult because you want to make sure that the world is uh, there for future generations. Huh? But instead of teaching your children about how to survive in the future, instead of worrying too much about those things, uh, give them Dhamma tools instead. Huh? Expose them to the Dhamma so they know how to create an inner life for themselves that is really worthwhile. So they are less exposed to external problems anyway. Yeah? That is really the kindest way you can deal with your children. Yeah? Because then your children will actually be able to deal with all the problems in the world anyway. They're always going to be there. It's always going to be problematic. Yeah? And then it will be far better. Yeah? So come back to this idea. Everything in the external world is problematic. Uh, everything in the external world is out of control. Uh, everything in the external world is uncertain. You don't know what's going to happen next. Uh, and because of that, uh, uh, you start to withdraw your interest in that external world. Uh, 
Politics doesn't matter so much anymore. Climate change doesn't matter so much anymore. What's happening around in society, okay, you do your best to help out, uh, but you realize that you cannot control the outcome. You become a bit like Ajahn Brahm, who says, okay, I will do it, do the good thing because it's good, uh, but I won't actually worry about the outcome or the result uh, because I don't know, a bushfire may come and burn everything down. Uh, and then you are on the right track. Uh, you look at your process. Uh, you look at how you live, you don't worry so much about the results. And then you live beautifully, you can help out in the world, but you know at the end of the day you cannot control the outcome. You do your very best. The whole external world is like that. Whenever you find yourself getting upset about something, it is always about the external world. Then you know where your attachments are, where your problems are, and then you know where you can let go a little bit. Five ex external world is everything, yeah, it's our family life, it is our work, it is what we see in the world of politics and everything, yeah. it is about ev the whole sphere, everything of that uh, is part of that external world uh, and it's all problematic. And then you start again to move in a different direction, uh, your inner life becomes important because uh, that is stable in a much more um, it is more stable, basically, than the outer world. Not only is it more stable, but it's also something that you can control more. You have more control over your own mind and actions uh, than you ever have of the external world. Uh, and that is why it is a, a, a place to find refuge, uh, rather than finding a refuge in that external world, which can never actually provide a refuge at all. Uh. So this is the right way to think about things. It's hard to do. Uh, yeah, you have to keep on doing this for a long time to be able to gain the benefits of seeing things in this way. But as you do so, what you're doing, you're shifting your attention, shifting your interest away from those things that are inherently problematic and moving your interest instead to those things where you actually can do something and where there is some possibility of stability, happiness, contentment and all of these kind of things. Does that make sense to anyone? Yeah, okay, good. I'm glad it makes sense. It's, um, these things are, take a long, t they're kind of obvious in a way when you hear about them, right? They sort of, we all kind of know these things, and yet even though we know it, we still get upset when we see bad news on TV. So th the problem is it takes a while for these things to sink in, and that is the thing here. And that's why you need to think about them again and again and again, yeah? And sort of gradually allow these things to become part of your psyche and your psychology, so you uh, almost automatically think like this. Uh. And this is hard, yeah? It's hard because the rest of the world does not think like this. The rest of the world would tend to get upset about these things. Uh, and that's why you have to come back to the Dhamma again and again and again. Remind yourself. This is why the Dhamma never gets boring, in my opinion. Uh. I can say the same thing a million times, I still don't get bored usually. <laughs> I feel a bit sorry for my audience, but otherwise I'm, I'm kind of okay. And actually it's a good precedent, yeah, if you, if you read what the Buddha, he also repeated himself all the time, so kind of, it, and this is because things need to be said again and again. You need to kind of be reminded again and again, and every time you hear it, it sinks in a little bit more deeply, and that is what is so good about this. Okay. Is there any questions about th this, or uh, should we maybe we can wait till this evening if you have some questions, uh, and uh, so we can maybe leave it for now. now. Okay, <coughs> so that kind of completes the um, mm, uh, the uh, ordinary part of the first noble truth. Uh, now we have looked at all those things that seem to be obvious. Uh, and hopefully we have gone a little bit beyond what the obvious, yeah, and hopefully you have been able to see this from a deeper point of view after all of this. Uh, but uh, I would recommend you to think about the, all of these points a little bit on your own, to make them your own truths. One thing is to hear someone uh, talking about these things. Uh, another thing is when it becomes your own wisdom inside, uh, then it becomes much more powerful. Uh, so you may agree with me, but that's not enough. You have to kind of make it your own. So, and how do you know it is your own? Well, one day when you sit up here and you teach other people, then you know it's your own. 
So you should have a roster, Bobby, a roster of people come up here and teach, yeah? So one after the other and you can teach. Because teaching is one of the best ways to actually learn about these things and think about them in a, in a good way. Yeah. So teaching is always a great privilege and I always recommend you to take the opportunity if you get a chance to teach. So if someone says, would you, would you like to give a teaching? You say, yes, please, uh, allow me to teach. Yeah, and you jump at the opportunity here, yeah, and you will learn so much if you take the opportunity here. Yeah. Anyway, so let us move on to uh, the next one. That is the simple part. Now we come to the really, really profound part of the first noble truth. And uh, in fact, uh, it is so profound that it's actually quite hard to understand um, actually, before we do that, uh, let me just briefly, there's some, uh, a couple of suttas further back here. If you go to the next sutta, it is called, it's MN 141, the analysis of the truth. So, yeah, a couple of pages down, uh, next sutta, yeah, the analysis of the truth. So, and I, I should probably read this out, first of all. I've forgotten what is in this, in here. Huh? Um, and uh, it's the next one after the one we have been looking at, after the Dhammachaka Sutta, the analysis of the truth. So, so just very briefly, and the reason why I want to read this out is because uh, sometimes these words, yeah, birth, old age, and death, Sometimes people say they are not meant literally. Yeah, these are metaphors. These are metaphors meaning that birth doesn't mean someone actually getting born. It means a mind state arising. Yeah, it's a metaphor for a mind state arising here. Yeah. That is kind of the idea of rebirth in Buddhism. Old age is like that mind state fading away here. Yeah, yeah, disappearing here. Yeah. And uh, death means the mind state going. Yeah. Yeah, so it's like a continuous thing being born and dying in your mind all the time. Uh, that's what people argue, especially when it comes to dependent origination, all of that, that's what they argue. Uh, but also in terms of the Four Noble Truths. So this little sutta here is just a, to point out to you what the suttas have to say about this. Uh, yeah? And it's kind of interesting for that reason. So what is rebirth? The rebirth, inception, conception, reincarnation, manifestation of the aggregates, the acquisition of the sense fields of various sentient beings in various orders of sentient beings. This is called rebirth. Yeah, so this various beings being born into various Classes of beings, birds being b born as birds, reptiles being born as reptiles, humans being born as humans, gods being born as gods, the yakas being born as yakas, uh, petas being born as petas, etc., etc. That is what this is saying. Yeah, you have the, all these words here, the manifestation of the aggregates, all of this means, yeah, ordinary birth, coming into existence. Uh, that is the purpose of this. Uh, so very clear that the suttas, when they talk about birth, they mean literal birth. Maybe, but maybe not. If you look at the, one of the words there is reincarnation, yeah, or conception. Well, when does conception and reincarnation happen? Well, it happens usually before birth. Yeah, you get born. Born means you come into this world, uh, but reincarnation or conception happens obviously before that. So this is the ambiguity in the Pali Suttas, that rebirth actually very often means the moment uh, that a consciousness moves from one life to the next one. Uh, and when consciousness arrives, for example, you know, in a mother in a, in a, in a fetus, uh, yeah, the first time the consciousness arises in that fetus, uh, that is often called birth in Buddhism. Uh, so that's when you are born, because you move from one life into the next one. But basically, that is even stronger, in that the meaning is actually rebirth. Yeah, this is what really the point here is. Uh, you're moving on from one life to the next one. Uh, you are acquiring the personality factors and the sense fields and all of that. Uh, so that's, that's birth, that's jati for you. Uh. So what is old age? This is jara in Pali, uh, sometimes translated as aging, which again is, is wrong. Uh, 
again comes from this idea that we're talking about metaphors so the, the, met, the mind state ages it doesn't, it doesn't get old of course it just ages uh, but um, again it's obviously not right yeah because what it means is the old age the decrepitude the broken teeth the gray hair the wrinkly skin the diminished vitality the failing faculties of various sentient beings and various orders of sentient beings. This is called old age. So what do you think? Does that sound like mind moments or does it sound like kind of physical bodies? Yeah, usually mind, mind moments don't have gray hair, right? They don't usually have broken teeth and this kind of thing. <laughs> So obviously, it must refer to physical bodies. Uh, yeah, I, don't, I think it's pretty clear. Uh, so I'm just pointing out what the sutta say because then it become, becomes more obvious what is going on. And what is death? The passing away, the perishing, uh, the disintegration, demise, mortality, death, disease, the breaking up of the aggregates, the laying to rest of the corpse. <laughs> The cutting off of the life faculty of various sentient beings and various orders of sentient beings. This is called death. So again, very kind of uh, gives a very clear picture as to what is going on. It doesn't really want you to kind of mistake things. Uh, yeah, it's pretty obvious. Can't get more graphic than that. You can almost see the dead body in your mind's eye when you read that, uh, because it's so kind of straight to the point. Uh. So that's kind of the first point here, just to make that point. I should have said that before, but I forgot that the sutta was even there. So, uh, but there you are. So thank you, uh, Wai Ying, for, for doing a really good job there and getting all the suttas in there. Uh, so that's good. Uh, so that is that one. Then let's have a quick look at the next sutta as well, because this is also kind of interesting, and it shows you how this uh, um, idea of right view, how it kind of loops around and comes back to the beginning again. And it's actually very useful at this particular point because it uh, also talks about the five aggregates, the Panch Upadana Kanda. The sutta <coughs> is called the development of Samadhi, of immersion. So I have heard at Savati, mendicants develop Samadhi. A mendicant who has samadhi truly understands. What do they truly understand? The, or the origin and ending of form. The origin and ending of feeling. The origin and ending of perception. The origin and ending of choices. The origin and the ending of consciousness. Yeah, and of course, the origin and ending of these things means that you understand the impermanence of these things. That's what it really, really refers to. Huh? These are the five khandas, yeah, the rupa, vedana, sanya, sankara, and vinyana khanda, what this is talking about. Uh, and this is about having insight into the five khandas. How does that insight arise from samadhi? This is one of the things you see again and again in the suttas, how insight uh, always is based on samadhi. You can see again this idea of looping back. Yeah, The Noble Eightfold Path ends with samadhi, loops back to right view. You gain the insight into the five khandas uh, at this particular point. Uh, so, and here we are also starting now to deal with the five aggregates, the five khandas, uh, which is what we are going to look at next now in terms of right view. Uh. Okay, so that, that was just very briefly, just to kind of look at those. Let's come back to the first noble truth again. Here. So I will just read out the very last part here. here. And uh, the last part of the first noble truth is, in brief, the five grasping aggregates are suffering here. So the five grasping aggregates are the Panch Upadana Kanda. Here. Yeah, this is uh, uh, a very common teaching that you find in the suttas in so many places. Uh, and this is a way of kind of uh, classifying a human being, a way of looking at these five aggregates. The word aggregate is very strange, and it's not really, I don't think it is a very good word. Uh, I would call it something like the five aspects of personality. Uh, that kind of makes sense, yeah? Five aspects of personality or the five aspects of a person. Huh? 
yeah, then it becomes more clear what it means. These are different areas of a human being, yeah? and the Buddha defines these particular areas. Yeah, they are defined in the suttas, uh, and this is the Panchupadana Kanda. Why does the Buddha divide a person up in this particular way? Yeah? What is the point of that? Uh, and the reason is because we have just seen that before. Uh, the idea is to gain insight uh, into these things, to understand what it is to be a human being. Uh, but to gain insight, you need to know how to focus. You need to know where to look. So these five khandhas are a way of showing you where to look to gain insight. Uh, now we're getting to really deep things here. Yeah? This is kind of really deep Dhamma. So far we have looked at the simple ideas of suffering and Dukkha. It's already deep enough. Now we're getting into really deep territory. Huh? So I ho hope you're ready, ready for this. Uh, so uh, the Buddha is saying, in brief, these five khandhas are Dukkha. Yeah? So this is who you are. This is the five aspects of personality. So the five aspects of personality are Dukkha, they are suffering. This is very radical. Yeah, this is really, really radical because sometimes the question is asked about this first noble truth. Is it, does the first noble truth, does it mean that uh, there is suffering in life? Or does it literally mean life is suffering? Yeah? There is suffering in life. Okay, we can all agree on that. Yeah? Everybody agrees that there is suffering in life. But to say life is suffering, it takes that idea much, much further. Because it means that life is almost defined as suffering. It's very hard to really grasp, yeah, to understand. Because sometimes you're happy, sometimes you suffer. So how can you say life is suffering? It doesn't make any sense. But here, the Buddha seems to be saying life is suffering. The five aspects of personality are Dukkha, that's what he's literally saying here. Yeah. So this is very challenging. Yeah. And this is where we get to the really profound aspects of the Buddha's teachings. Yeah. And if we are going to be able to answer this properly, if it is true, we're going to have to be able to answer why it is that even happy feelings can be regarded as suffering from a higher perspective. Yeah. These are the things we're going to have to be able to answer to understand what is going on here. Yeah. You see what I'm trying to say? Yeah? yeah? So before we do that, what I would like to do is to first of all ask what are these five khandhas? Uh, yeah, to explain, to talk about them a little bit. Uh, because very often people don't understand. I, it's a question I get very often on retreats. People say, well, what are these five khandhas? Uh, and, and I say, oh, they are form, feeling, perception, will, uh, and consciousness. And then they say, but what are they? <laughs> It's not really enough, yeah, just to define them like that. Uh, yeah, it's, it's, it's not. It, it's my fault as a teacher just to kind of list them up like that. It doesn't really work. Yeah. I want to know a practical way to understand what the five khandhas are. What is that practical way? That practical way is that what you are experiencing right at this moment. Uh, that's the five khandhas. Can you feel the five khandhas? Body. This is Rupa, Rupa Kanda, yeah, you know straight away. This is also when I see, look out here, loudspeaker, this is also Rupa Kanda, you see these things, yeah. What you hear also is related to that Rupa Kanda. A lot of that is, that's Rupa Kanda, it's all the world of the material things around us. That's really what Rupa Kanda is. It goes even beyond that. Let's say that you die or you have an out of body experience. Then, when you have an outer body experience, you still have form. Yeah, There's still your body is still there, but it's a different kind of form. It's a lighter form. It's not as dense as the human form. It's a much more pleasant kind of form when you have an outer body experience. Has anyone here has a, had an outer body experience ever? No. If if you if you want to. Maybe Venerable here has had a, If you want to say, and if, if you have, if we don't want to say in public, that's okay. But if you, if you want to write down and say, yeah, I had a, you, you're welcome to do so. Yeah? Make sure that you, I cannot decipher your handwriting. Take, cut out some letters from the, you know, from the page here and kind of glue them in so nobody can decipher your handwriting or whatever. <laughs> but many people have had these experiences. Yeah? I meet people all the time who have these kind of experiences. It's very, very common. But there too, you have form. And that form that you have there is also called rupa. It's a finer kind of rupa. So form is actually quite 
pervasive. It comes in many, many different shapes and types, uh, depending on where, which realm you are in, and all of these kind of things. Uh, it's a very kind of broad category. And even in the jhana states, there's some very last remnant of form, very, very subtle. It's only when you come to the arupa jhanas, the, or not jhanas, the immaterial attainments, uh, uh, infinite space and all this, that's when you go completely beyond form. That's kind of way, way down there. You're almost an arahant before you get there. Uh, so it's a long way down. So form is a very, very big part of our world. So this is form. And then there is feelings. Yeah? And what is, how do you feel right now? Do you feel miserable or happy or neutral or tired or whatever? Yeah? Like you're tired, it doesn't really count. It's more like whether you feel good, not good or neutral. That's really what Vedana is about. Yeah. And usually we have some kind of relationship to our experience, yeah? Maybe you think, oh, when is this monk going to shut up? I've had enough now. <laughs> maybe that's what you think. And then that, that means you have dukkha, dukkha vedana. Or maybe you think, oh, he's saying some interesting things, yeah? And then you have a bit more sukha vedana. Or maybe you think, oh, yeah, whatever. Then you have neutral veda, vedana, yeah? So all of this depends on how you are experiencing what is happening now, whether you enjoy it or not. That's kind of, that's the Vedana part. All, there's always a Vedana. Whenever you have an experience, there is Vedana. Huh? Always present. Uh. So that's the physical thing that you experience now, then the, that's the Vedana. Then there is perception. Huh? Sanya, what is Sanya? Sanya is that which makes you able to make sense of the world. Uh. Yeah, sure, there is form, I can see all these forms around us, but to be able to make sense of these forms, you need perception. Huh? So you see people. People is a perception, it's a particular kind of form. And then you think of people. Or you see chairs, tables, yeah? you see a room. Uh, you think of the BGF. The idea of BGF is a perception, it's an idea. Yeah? It's something that helps you to make sense of the world. You look at people, maybe they're friends, or some other people are enemies. This is also a perception. You hear things and then making sense of the hearing is a perception. There's a message in what is being said, yeah? That is the perception that gives rise to that. So whenever we are making sense of the world in one way or another, uh, it is always perception that does that, making sense of the world. Uh, and every conscious moment there is perception because you want to have to make sense of the world. Uh, Then there is sankara. Sankara is that which drives us as human beings. Yeah? So whenever you do anything, you are run by something, there's something which drives you. And that is sankara, it's the will, it's the intention, it is the choices that we make all the time. Yeah, so whether you decide, what, whatever it is, whenever you make a decision, we make decisions all the time. Whenever you move your body, whenever you think anything, it's a sankara that lies behind that, that drives us. Sankara is defined in the Abhidhamma much more broadly, but the Abhidhamma, in my opinion, is not so interesting here. Much more interesting to see how the Buddha defines Sankaras, and is always defined as Sanchetana. Chetana means intention or the will. That's the way it is always defined in the, uh, in the suttas. Uh. So whenever you move, whenever you make a choice, whenever you do anything, you move your mind, that is Sankara, very, very important part of uh, of. Uh, life. Yeah? Right now you have sankhara, you decide what you want to do, whether you want to think about something or whether you want to listen or whatever it is, uh, that is your choice right now. Huh? And then there is the last one, this is vinyana. Vinyana is consciousness. Uh, and consciousness just means the ability to be aware, to be present, uh, to know what is going on, that is consciousness. Yeah? And that also is always there. If you, are not, if you don't have any consciousness, uh, nothing can happen as a consequence. Uh, consciousness is always present. Uh, present. So it's actually quite simple. This is the five khandhas. Uh, and if you think about your experience right now, all those five khandhas are there. All those five khandhas are almost always with you. It's just a way of classifying human experience, or even animal experience, will be the same. It will also have the five khandhas there. So we have classifying experience into component parts. Uh. 
Yeah, now you can start to feel what the five khandas are. They're not very abstract. Uh, they come back to us straight away. So use your immediate experience to understand what the five khandas are. Then you are on the right track. Instead of thinking of them as some sort of abstract or theoretical thing that you can read about in the suttas. Uh. So what this means then, and this is what is so radical about it, it means that if the five khandas are aspects of experience, uh, it means that experience itself is dukkha, is suffering. Uh. To experience is bad, not to experience, if experience is bad, and not to experience is better. Uh. This is why, what I mean, this is really radical, yeah? And this is why this is so kind of hard to really grasp. So, how can we get around this? How can we get to understand that this is true? And actually, it is not that hard if you just have to think about it in the right way. If you think about it in the wrong way, it sounds scary because we all want to experience it. But if you think about it in the right way, actually, it is very liberating and very beautiful even. Huh? So again, come back to the idea of meditation practice. Uh, yeah, come back to the idea when you have felt very peaceful and at ease and very calm. How do you feel at that time? You feel better. Uh, but uh, even though you feel better, there is actually less of the five khandas in that state. Uh, the more peaceful you are, the more calm you are, the deeper your meditation is, the less there is of the five khandas. The less there is of the five khandas, the better you feel. Ergo, yeah, conclusion must be, five khandas are bad, they are dukkha. The less there is of them, the better you feel. So the more experience you have, basically it's just disturbing, it's troublesome. The less experience you have, the more happy you tend to feel. So experience, in a sense, you can see why it is dukkha. When you get into a state of samadhi, there's hardly any experience left. All that is left is bliss. Yeah, bliss and the unity of mind and all of this wonderful experience, really, really marvelous experience, but it's almost nothing there. And yet, it is one of the most powerful, blissful experiences uh, that is possible to have as a human being. Yeah. And this starts to show you that there is something very interesting going on here. As experience is reduced, uh, as the five khandas fade away, you feel better. It's preferable. Uh. You deepen the samadhi even further, even more things disappear. And after a while, the penny starts to drop. Uh. Yeah, after a while you start to see that this path towards cessation, cessation, the ending of things, is inherently positive, it's a good thing. If you take it all the way, then the full ending of everything must also be the highest kind of happiness. And this is what the Buddha says in the suttas. The ending, the sanya vidayita niroda, the ending of all things of perception and feeling, that is the highest happiness in the suttas. So this is how this works, yeah? And this is why uh, the five khandas and the, why they are dukkha and why they are uh, problematic and how then you can actually come to see this and understand this in your own practice. But I want to make it even more kind of clear, yeah? So like, let's, let's make it even more clear because still it may, you may not be 100% sure what is going on here. And to make it even more clear, let's go to the discourse on mindfulness of breathing. Yeah. And this is found on page, uh, you have different pages from me, but it's a few suttas f forward, it's not, not very far, a couple of suttas uh, forward. Uh, um, same page number, aha, okay, page 11 then, same page number, that's very handy, okay. Wow, you have been very wise, uh, uh, you've really done this very, very well. Same page, page 11. Okay. So page 11, Discourse on Mindfulness of Breathing. Yeah, this is a very famous discourse of the Buddha, and I love to teach this one because it is so, such a powerful thing. But what I want to do here is just to focus very briefly on that one paragraph there. Uh, that one paragraph is the, the one... Uh, the last paragraph in that, or the second last paragraph in that sutta. Yeah, he says here, he trains thus, or they train thus. I shall breathe in contemplating impermanence. He trains thus, I shall breathe out contemplating impermanence. He trains thus, I shall breathe in contemplating fading away. 
I train thus, I shall breathe out, contemplating fading away. He trains thus, I shall breathe in, contemplating cessation. He trains thus, I shall breathe out, contemplating cessation. I train thus, I shall breathe in, contemplating relinquishment. He trains thus, I shall breathe out, contemplating relinquishment. So, what is going on here? And what is going on here is that you have just been practicing mindfulness of breathing, yeah? And in that process of mindfulness of breathing, the mind becomes more and more still, more and more peaceful, until, you see, this just before what I was reading, it says, I will breathe in, liberating the mind. The moment you liberate the mind, you reach a deep state of liberation. This is a samadhi experience, that's where you liberate the mind, yeah? So you have taken the mindfulness of breathing all the way to the stage of liberating the mind, vimochayang chittang, and then, having done that, you come out, then you do this contemplation. You look at those contemplations, they're all about things disappearing, changing. Yeah, first of all, they change, then they fade away, then they disappear. It's all, a, all about how things are impermanent, yeah? about things kind of gradually disappearing. That's what it refers to. Huh? So what are the things that are disappearing here? And the things that you are contemplating is the process of meditation you have just been through. Huh? You have just been doing mindfulness of breathing. Yeah, first there is 12 steps, this is all, all, all very abbreviated here, 12 steps of mindfulness of breathing. You have gone through that whole process of mindfulness of breathing, then you do this contemplation. Huh? So you are thinking back on that process. Uh, and what do you see when you think back? Well, what you see when you think back on that process is the five khandhas disappearing. This is how you contemplate the five khandhas in practice. Uh, because what you see when you think back is you see you have been watching your breath. Uh, and as you have been watching your breath, the body has gradually disappeared. Uh, yeah, this is what happens when you watch the breath. Gradually the body becomes less and less until it's completely gone with mindfulness of breathing. Yeah. When you are following the breath, you see the five senses gradually disappearing. You see less, you hear less, uh, until eventually even the feeling in the body is completely gone. You can't even feel the breath anymore. This is what happens through this process. Uh. So this process shows you the impermanence of the rupa kanda. This is all the form kanda. It shows you how that rupa kanda fades away as you go deeper and deeper in meditation uh, until eventually it ceases completely. When you enter a state of samadhi, rupa kanda is completely gone. You can't feel the body anymore. There is no body there, there is no senses, everything is gone. Uh. So when you come out, you think back, you reflect and you look at that process. Uh, and what you see is a beautiful, delightful process. Uh, and you realize that form is a pain. It's a pain. It's a problem. Yeah? It's dukkha. Because as you go through this process, you become more and more happy. First of all, it is impermanent. It changes away. It changes, disappears. Uh, then it is dukkha because you're much more happy without it. Uh, it's also anatta. You know it's anatta, non-self. Why? Well, because you can't even access it when you go into samadhi. It's completely gone from your world. Uh, so it must also be non-self. Uh. So you, but especially what we're talking about here is we're talking about dukkha. Yeah, that's the first noble truth. You understand it is dukkha because you see it fading away. So notice that in your own meditation. Notice this form fading away and disappearing. And notice how delightful it is. This is how you contemplate the five aggregates in practice. It's actually very simple. You don't really have to think all that much about it. You come out of meditation, it's Bleeding obvious, yeah? Of course it's happy now because the body is gone. You understand that straight away. It's actually quite, ha quite easy to see. You don't have to make a big deal out of it. You don't have to write in your book, Ajahn Brahmali says, you know, contemplate this. You don't have to do that because uh, it's obvious when you come out. You look at the feelings and the body is a similar kind of thing. If you watch the feelings as you start out, you will still have some unpleasant feelings in the body, some pain in the body, uh, there may be some unpleasant thoughts in your mind. But as you purify, as you go deeper in this process, uh, the body disappears, as the body disappears, the pains of the body are gone. Uh, 
as you purify the mind by thinking about all your kalyanamittas here and all the good things in your life, the negative thoughts, negative feelings, thoughts are gone. After a while you don't feel anything negative anymore. All you feel is bliss. This is why this path leads towards bliss, because you're leaving out all the negative things. You can see the negative feelings ceasing, gradually fading away and ceasing. Then you can see that the happy feelings are transforming into more and more happy feelings until eventually even the happy feelings disappear as well. And that's even better. It's better to not feel happy feelings than to feel happy feelings. Anyway, I'll, I'll let you think about that one. We'll come back to that one later on. <laughs> yeah, and so you see all of these things changing and this is how you contemplate feeling. You're seeing things disappearing gradually and you see the beauty of this changing in this way here. And it's very, very, the insight again is very obvious. Perception, very similar thing again. Yeah, perception is how we view the world. You lose your perception of the body. You lose the perception of the five senses. Your perception becomes very simplified. Eventually, may, maybe you get a samadhi nimitta arising, a light in the mind. That is very simple perception. Almost everything is gone. Your perception, that's all that is left. And when, that, that, when everything else is gone, and that is all that is left, again, you feel really marvelous then that perception too disappears, you go into a jhana state, even better. Perception is changing, disappearing, becoming simplified. The less there is of perception, the more happy you are, the more it ceases, the better it is. The will, as you go through the process of meditation, the will becomes less and less. Everything becomes more and more still. The stillness of the mind is a measure for how little will is left. The less will there is, the more happy you feel. There's no movement. It's just beautiful. Stillness. This is what stillness is. A lack of mental movement. Yeah, lack of will, not doing anything. And you realize that the will is a pain in the bottom. Actually, it's a pain everywhere. I'm not sure if the will is a pain on the bottom. Not sure if it has anything to do with the bottom, but you know what I mean. Yeah, the will, <laughs> the will is a problem. So you let go. As you let go of the will, you understand that the will too is dukkha. The will is dukkha, isn't that kind of astonishing? Yeah. We always want to use our will, we think the will is great, because the will, then we can choose. We can choose what we really want. Yeah, we can choose what we want in life. Hooray, I can choose. We're so happy. And we think that the will is essential to give us happiness, and then it turns out that the will actually is just part of the whole process of dukkha. You are much more happy when you let go of the will. Having the will is like you having you know, you're having some kind of, um, uh, you, know, you know, dung or something like that, and then you can choose different kinds of dung. Much better to get rid of the dung. Yeah, you know what I'm saying? The problem is the rubbish. You're holding on to rubbish. That's the problem. When you let you, whether you can choose that kind of rubbish or that kind of rubbish is kind of irrelevant. Get rid of the rubbish and take the gold. What would you rather have, gold or rubbish? It's your choice. So then you choose gold, of course at the end of the day. Actually, gold isn't that great, but anyway, that's a different, that's a different story. Yeah. And then the last one is the consciousness, yeah? As you go this, through this process, because consciousness is tied up with all of these other things, uh, consciousness too is gradually disappearing, becoming simpler and simpler and simpler as you go through this process. Uh, this is how you come to understand that the five khandas are dukkha. Very often people say, we, we, you read this in the sutta as Panchaparana Kanda Dukkha. The Buddha often tells us to contemplate these things and it's not very obvious how we should do it. Uh, this is how you do it. It is not, nothing magical about it. It's actually very simple once you understand the process. It's very exciting. This is a very exciting process, yeah? Because it is just so, you under, start to understand about the meaning of life. Uh, you start to understand where real happiness is to be found. Uh, it's to be found. Uh, this is very interesting, yeah? and uh, nothing in the world is more interesting than this. Uh, this is where you really start to discover the meaning of life and what this is all about. Uh. So, uh, enjoy this, uh, yeah? practice this, uh, and uh, uh, it make it practical, don't make it too theoretical. The Dhamma is often made out to be theoretical, and it tends to not really touch us properly when it's theoretical. It's important to bring it into your life, to really understand what this is about. It's actually simple. When we talk about it, it often becomes complex, but really it is actually quite simple. So there you are, 
first noble truth. Yeah? We have now looked at it, the content of the first noble truth. I I'm not sure, maybe I will talk a little bit more about it, I'm not sure if I will, uh, but um, we'll see what happens tomorrow, probably that will be enough uh, of that one, but I will talk about Dukkha from other points of view, and that will be what uh, the, the next two days will all, all be about, looking at Dukkha from various kind of points of view, to expand the idea of right view, yeah? especially in terms of the first noble truth. Uh, but uh, now let us have a break and we'll see you back again around a quarter past four.